Enigma depravatio est. Enigma crudelitas est. Welcome back to part two of my final video on the Atlantean Apocalypse. This will most likely be my last video on YouTube in regards to Atlantis, so please see my past videos for context on the hypothesis of Atlantis and Eden being Egypt. Now let's address some more parallels. People in the right wing agnostic New Age community like Randall Carlson and Johanna James like to use the Atlantis story, thinking it's more secular than the Eden story, as evidence for a lost civilization. But they tend to ignore another story, because if they accept this one, then logically they would be forced to put Atlantis back in its original historical context. Inland of the coast lie the ruins of yet another civilization, also destroyed during the Bronze Age. The place, the ancient city of Troy. Recent discoveries suggest that Troy, scene of the legendary Trojan War, may have been one and the same as Atlantis. There are numerous similarities between Homer's description of the Trojan War and Plato's account of Atlantis. Both of them mention 1,200 ships. Both of them mention chariots. Both of them mention bronze weapons. And they both describe in much detail how the armies were organized. The uh, parallels are really overwhelming. For centuries, Troy, like Atlantis, was only a legend, with no real proof that it ever existed. The poet Homer's description of the Trojan War in the Iliad was considered nothing more than just a good story. But in the 1860s, a wealthy German explorer named Heinrich Schliemann, armed with a copy of Homer's writings as his guide, doggedly began searching the Turkish coast, where the Mediterranean connects with the Black Sea. Within a year, he had unearthed a city that completely matched Homer's description. Troy leapfrogged from being a legend to a fact, almost overnight. Prior to Heinrich Schliemann, most people felt that the stories about Troy told by Homer and other poets were fanciful inventions. When Schliemann actually found Troy, it made everyone sit up and take notice and say, wait, maybe Greek mythology is not purely invention. The discovery of Troy fueled a fury of interest in Atlantis. If Troy could be found, why not Atlantis? But even more tantalizing to those searching for Atlantis was the possibility that Plato and Homer could have been talking about the very same place. Might Troy not perhaps be Atlantis? Recent excavations reveal that ditches around Troy match Plato's descriptions of concentric waterways around the Atlantean capital city. Plato was not a te technician or anything like that. He was a philosopher. Um, but he came up with a model, um, a description of a port system, which made perfect sense. The ports were discovered precisely at the place um, where they should have been, according to Plato's account. The most compelling similarity between Atlantis and Troy was that of war. In Plato's text, the Atlanteans terrorized the entire Mediterranean, culminating in a long and brutal battle with the Greeks, similar to Homer's description of the Trojan War. In both accounts, the Greeks hold back the invading onslaught, finally freeing the region from the grip of terror. Perhaps this explains one of the mysteries of Plato's account of Atlantis, his abrupt ending to the story. Plato's Atlantis account stops in mid-sentence, and it's one of the mysteries surrounding it. The whole account gives the impression of something that's polished and edited, uh, but th that wouldn't explain why he stopped it. <laughs> 
Could it have been that once Plato realized his account was one and the same as Homer's account of Troy, he decided to abandon its writing? Plato went on to write one more of his famous dialogues, but not another word about Atlantis. I think it's plausible that the war that Plato mentions in Atlantis is inspired by Homer's story, for Plato would have known about the Trojan War. Anything across the Aegean and the Atlantic Sea was seen as the old world of the Atlanteans, which included the Hittites. Professor Mary Bakfarova of Willamette University in Oregon points out that it's more likely that the Trojan War was one of many along the coastal city-states of Anatolia and it was really the Mycenaeans that were the ones invading the coastal regions as the Hittites were expanding their power west and east around 1650 BC. She emphasizes that Homer has a bias in the story for the Proto-Greeks against the Trojan Hittites. There was a larger geopolitical expansion of the Atlanteans, Egypt expanding to the Palestinian region, and the Hittites were expanding west and south towards Egypt. There were rebellions along the coastal city-states like the Asua Rebellion against the Hittites, but this dates to about 1500 BC as the current theory. Traditional Troy is said to take place around 1200 BC according to Homer. This would fit with the Late Bronze Age Collapse theory, but Professor Vakvarova argues that the story is older according to the Hittite records. So I would put my money on the Asua Rebellion dates, which may also have a margin of error that we need to consider if Plato alludes that the wars happened just before the destruction of Atlantis, which included the Sea People of the Mycenaeans, for Plato seems to imply that both sides were destroyed. So I think 1650 BC may not be the birth of the Hittites, but the height of their power, just like Egypt, until the Thera eruption put a pause to the wars. So we may need to consider that archaeologists may have the dates wrong for the bigger war between Egypt and the Hittites, with the Battle of Kadesh. So Ramses may truly be the pharaoh of the Exodus, for the current theory of the Battle of Kadesh takes place 74 years before the theory of the Late Bronze Age collapse. So do we need to shift the timeline by 300 years and keep the same rulers, or do we have the wrong rulers? In part 1 we see that the Epic of Gilgamesh flood version tablet dates around 1300 BC, 300 years after the Thera eruption. The Late Bronze Age theory argues that there was a Dark Age that lasted for about 300 years until new tablet records were rewritten or revised, after the Hittite collapse. But there is an older legend that may have inspired the Epic of Gilgamesh flood version and even the Trojan War according to Professor Bakvarova, and that is the Curse of Agade. Enlil, the roaring storm that subjugates the entire land, the rising deluge that cannot be confronted, was considering what should be destroyed in return for the wrecking of his beloved Ikur. He lifted his gaze towards the Gubin Mountains and made all the inhabitants of the broad mountain ranges descend. Enlil brought out of the mountains those who do not resemble other people, who are not reckoned as part of the land the Gutians, an unbridled people with human intelligence but canine instincts and monkey's features. Like small birds they swooped on the ground in great flocks. Because of Enlil, they stretched their arms out across the plain like a net for animals. Nothing escaped their clutches, no one left their grasp. Messengers no longer traveled the highways, the quarry's boat no longer passed along the rivers. The Gutians drove their trusty goats of Enlil out of their folds and compelled their herdsmen to follow them. They drove the cows out of their pens and compelled the cowherds to follow them. Prisoners manned the watch. Brigands occupied the highways. The doors of the city gates of the land lay dislodged in mud and all the foreign lands uttered bitter cries from the walls of their cities. They established gardens for themselves within the cities, and not as usual on the wide plain outside. 
as if it had been before the time when cities were built and founded. The large arable tracts yielded no grain. The inundated tracts yielded no fish. The irrigated orchards yielded no syrup or wine. The thick clouds did not rain. The Makgurum plant did not grow. In those days, oil for one shekel was only half a litre. Grain for one shekel was only half a litre. Wool for one shekel was only one miner. Fish for one shekel filled only one barn measure. They sold at such prices in the markets of the cities. Those who lay down on the roof died on the roof. Those who lay down in the house were not buried. People were flailing at themselves from hunger. By the key Ur, and Lil's great place, dogs were packed together in the silent streets. If two men walked there, they would be devoured by them. And if three men walked there, they would be devoured by them. Noses were punched, heads were smashed, noses were piled up, heads were sown like seeds. Honest people were confounded with traitors. Heroes lay dead atop of heroes. The blood of traitors ran upon the blood of honest men. At that time, Enlil rebuilt his great sanctuaries into small reed sanctuaries, and from east to west, he reduced their storehouses. Old women who survived those days, and old men who survived those days, and the chief lamentation singer who survived those years, set up seven balage drums, as if they stood on the horizon, and together with the oob drums, made them resound to Enlil like Ikur for seven days and seven nights. The old women did not restrain the cry, Alas for my city! The old men did not restrain the cry, Alas for its people! The lamentation singer did not restrain the cry, Alas for the Ikur! Again, Suen, Enki, Inanna, Ninurta, Ikur, Utu, Nuska, and Nisaba, all the gods whosoever turned their attention to the city and cursed the god severely. People forget that there was a major exodus towards Assyria coming from the Hittites after the collapse. King Supulima I speaks of a plague but this account of the plagues doesn't align with the late Bronze Age collapse unless you shift the timeline of the Hittite dynasties. Most scholars would say this would cause more problems than it solves, but the chronology of the Hittite tablets could be off by hundreds of years. If there was a mistake between Supalima I and Supalima II, the current dating of the tablet AO6890 of the Curse of Akade is said to be around 2047 BC to 1750 BC. This puts it older than the flood version of the Epic of Gilgamesh, which may have been inspired by the Curse of Akade, written closer to the timeline of the destruction. We need to find which tablet's accounts are closest to the Santorini eruption dates. But when it comes to the Curse of Agade, most historians connect this with the Akkadian ruler of Narm-Sin, but the tablets are dating younger than narm sin stila accounts which are dated to 2200 BC. Now, this correlates with the climate change of the 4.2 Kilir event, also at 2200 BC. This event is hypothesized to have been caused possibly by a volcano, but if we connect this with the Santorini eruption, we would have to say that Santorini dates are off by 600 years to correlate to the 4.2 Kilir dates. Archaeologists have theorized that the event could have been the cause of the Indo-Aryan migration and the collapse of the Old Kingdom of Egypt. This would really throw a wrench into the Late Bronze Age collapse theory putting the error a thousand years off. I'm not sure if I'm even willing to go there, but there's definitely some evidence to say that the Great Pyramids of Egypt are older, such as the Dixon Relic and Luminescence dating, but there's definitely margins of errors on those. The earliest date of the tablet on the Curse of Akade and the oldest date of the Thera eruption puts that only about 67 years apart, 
Just like the Ipoer Papyrus, something happened that caused a major large exodus into the Atlantean world. It is very clear that Plato's Atlantis is taking elements from the Middle East within different time periods, which complicates the story. For example, there is another clue that I overlooked, that Plato references as pillars or pillars of Orichalcum, and there's a reference in the Old Testament to this. At the front of the temple were two large bronze pillars that flanked the porch. The pillar on the left was named Boaz, and the pillar on the right was named Joachim. The tops were decorated with lily flower petals and pomegranates. Pomegranates were a sign of prosperity and posterity because of their many seeds, and were also found on the bottom hem of the clothing of the high priest. Once you entered the main doors, you entered the holy place, a large room 40 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 30 cubits tall. The room was overlaid with gold and decorated with cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, possibly alluding to the beauty of the Garden of Eden. I've established that the Garden of Eden was Egypt in my past videos. Now the clue of a bronze pillar, or most likely a copper-clated stone pillar, also points to Egypt being part of Atlantis, for the Palestinian region was part of Egypt's domain until the Bronze Age collapsed. Plato is most likely reading other philosophers or historians' accounts of their travels to the Atlantean world, incorporating this element into his account of Atlantis. It's likely that Greeks would have stopped in Jerusalem before heading off to Persia where they encountered the round cities like Ecbatana and Darabagard, for which Plato may be getting his description of a circular city-state. Fitting to J. Gwen Griffith's hypothesis of Atlantis being an amalgamation of old world elements for the inspiration of Atlantis, and J. G. Bennett's hypothesis connecting it back to the Exodus. But it wasn't limited to just Egypt, as James Cameron's documentary will have you believe but they're both right to connect it back to the Santorini eruption. So perhaps the cataclysmic events described in the Bible, such as plagues, darkness, and the parting of a sea, are somehow connected to the Santorini eruption. But like all things related to the Exodus, Dating the Santorini eruption to 1500 BCE can be controversial. People have been arguing about the dates of Santorini. Volcanologists and geologists would date the eruption in the 1600s BC. Archaeologists tend to date it in the 1500s BC. Digging at Avaris, Professor Bitak has no doubt that he can pinpoint the Santorini eruption to the exact time period where we place the exodus. Here, Pumis from the Santorini eruption appears for the first time. So from archeological point of view, it looks very much as if the eruption happened early in the 18th dynasty, let us say around 1500 BC. Yakubovich's chronology machine has now synchronized a pharaoh named Ahmose, the Hyksos expulsion, the Exodus, and the Santorini eruption. It appears that the Exodus code has finally been cracked. If Yakubovich is right, we can now explain the science underlying the biblical story. We can even explain what caused the greatest miracle of them all, the parting of the Red Sea. We can then trace the biblical map and discover the real Mount Sinai. Now, James Cameron's film puts more weight on the Egyptologist dating of the pumice in Egypt, which may have a margin of error that we are not aware of. But if the Tempest Steel is dating to 1550 BC, 
then we should put more weight on the carbon dating of the pumice in Santorini, which dates no older than 1680 BC. So something is off, and this may go back to the idea that the birth of Egyptian civilization may be older than the foundation dates established, which could be off by half a century or two on certain artifacts. Now, one thing I'm sure that Cameron's film gets wrong is the location of Mount Sinai. And some of the Christian ascetics in Egypt moved into the Sinai Peninsula. That was their new area for the desert, the new area in which they would seek God, get along with God. When it was under Israeli control, they found nothing, really, which would suggest Israelite interest in that area out of uh, over 8,000 inscriptions from the southern half of the Sinai Peninsula. Only a handful are Hebrew or Aramaic, hardly any. And so the tradition of identifying one of the mountains in the Sinai Peninsula with the Mountain of Moses was a Christian invention, purely a Christian invention, without any Jewish precedence whatsoever. No Jews were ever interested in the Sinai Peninsula with any respect anyway to Moses. Nor does their geography resemble biblical descriptions of the beach where Pharaoh's army confronted Moses and his people. For Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, they are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. So this seems to be implying that Pharaoh trapped them in the Garden of Eden, where they were fleeing from town to town. They may have wanted to leave during this natural disaster that was unfolding, but Pharaoh would not let them go outside the garden into the wilderness, referring to the deserts. Now Noah, I bet, is another character experiencing the same event around the same time. These two stories are not separated by thousands of years. Noah may have been another Hyksof pre-Israelite Egyptian like Moses who may have truly believed that a flood was coming and wanted to leave, but Pharaoh wanted them to continue to work on his projects. The way he would have trapped them is by controlling all the bridges on the Nile and its tributaries, possibly at Avaris. Noah, whoever he represents, took boats while Moses fled on caravans. Possibly they knew each other and possibly they did not really know each other. So yeah, hundreds of thousands of people may have wanted to leave, and this would have had an economic impact on Pharaoh at the time, which is why he wanted to block them, thinking that they were being too hysterical about the disaster. The Sea of Reeds was on a river that might have been flooded and was continuing to rise until the whole delta was underwater. Also in the Quran's perspective, Midian is one of the cities of the plain, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, which is also the same event. This was shocking for me once I started to piece together the context of these stories. There are only two main geopolitical agricultural spaces, and that is the Jordan Valley and the bigger Nile Oasis. Moses fled the capital of Heliopolis or Memphis to one of these towns, somewhere in the Nile Delta, possibly near Avaris. All these place names have been changed or shifted to some degree over the millenniums. Now in regards to Mount Sinai, I agree with Ralph Ellis that it is the Great Pyramids of Giza, because the Egyptologist Dr. David Folk also shows that there's another clue that points to the early Jews being part of an Egyptian dynasty like the Hyksos and that is the Ark of the Covenant. The architectural description of this fits very well with Egyptian treasure boxes found in the temples and tombs. I think we can look at the Ten Commandments kind of like basic laws of Egypt, like a constitution written down on stone stelas, for which Egypt has many of these kind of stelas. 
I think the early Hebrew Egyptians wanted to retrieve these sacred relics out of one of the pyramids in Giza as the natural disaster was unfolding during a time of political and religious instability at the end of the 13th dynasty. We have to consider that if Genesis chronology is off, then so too could the sequence of the Exodus scenes also be off. The clue that points to Mount Sinai being the Great Pyramid is in Exodus 24:12. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there, and I will give you the tablets of stone, and a law, and the commandments for which I have written, that thou must teach them. And Moses rose up with his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God, the original mountain of Poseidon. A little earlier in Exodus in 1912, it says, Take heed to yourselves, that ye go not up into the mountain, or touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mountain shall be surely put to death. Now this sounds like it's being guarded, for which the Giza Plateau may have been guarded, the pyramids and the temple complex around it reserved mainly for the pharaoh. So the border is the king's chamber, possibly, or the outside ring of the pyramid and its temple complex. What's interesting is that in the king's chamber of the empty sarcophagus, the dimensions are pretty close to the description of the Ark of the Covenant. So it's possible that this was meant to be a tomb at one point in time, but by this time it was used as simply a housing of a treasure box. So the pyramids may have acted almost like a bank as well as like a secondary throne room or temple complex. It also says this about Mount Sinai in Exodus 24.10. And they saw that God of Israel there was under his feet, as it were a paved work of sapphire stone, as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. Seems that there was some kind of pavement at the base of the mountain, which resembles the night sky, something like the bluish gray black basalt pavers at the mortuary temple in front of the pyramid, which may at one time have been covering the whole plaza entrance side of the pyramid if the pyramids were being used like throne rooms or repositories. It would have been polished and when juxtaposed with the polished casing stones, it would have stood out at certain times of the day. It's possible even stars were painted on the basalt plaza to resemble the night sky like some tombs. It also describes as sitting on the edge of the desert. So we have a mountain that resembles the night sky that you can go into and has a black pavement or base at the edge of the desert, the dwelling place of God. And what would be more fitting for the mountain of God than the literal pyramids of Egypt, a monument to gods, or the God. What's also interesting is Sinai does in its translation refer to the idea of the sun or shining in white, just like the Tour limestone on the pyramids. So I think there's enough clues to say that they weren't just wandering in the literal Sinai Peninsula that we call it today, but that this was all still taking place within the main part of Egypt. But the sequences might be off. Looking at this through the fragmentary documentary hypothesis, we need to consider the possibility that the Garden of Eden chapter, the Great Flood chapter, and the Exodus chapter are all one and the same story told by different scribes in different areas of Egypt's empire, only much later put into a chronological order as the new Jewish kingdom was being born around 1000 BC, which needed a revisionist history away from Egypt. Just like Mount Sinai, there's another mountain that may have the wrong location and the wrong name, and that is Mount Ararat. Some argue that if the flood was just regional, it would not fit the description of the ark coming to rest on Mount Ararat, as that would be too far north and too high for the regional flood to reach. Well, this is true, but the text says the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat, not specifically the mountain of Ararat. Plus, Ararat might be a mistranslation. The word might actually refer to the Aratu Mountains further south. Edward Lipinski notes based on older pronunciations, the text might actually be referring to the mountains of Uratu 
He says, the old pronunciation urat is attested by the spelling hurat in Isaiah 37, 38, read in the great Isonic manuscript from Qumran. Furthermore, several later works refer to the area where the ark came to rest, to being around Mount Judy, which is in the mountains of Uratu. As Irving Finkel says, Biblical Ararat corresponds to the ancient name Uratu, which was the ancient political and geographical entity due north of the Mesopotamian heartland, included in the map of the world. So it is plausible the ark came to rest in Uratu, and this is also an odd choice to place the ark. If they were inventing a myth, it would make more sense to pick a mountain significant to Israel, like Sinai or Mount Zion, for theological messaging. Instead, they pick an out-of-place mountain region that has nothing to do with Israel and has no theological significance, supporting the idea they were reporting what historically happened instead of inventing a legend. Walton and Longman say, it is significant to note that if the biblical account were simply adopting a Mesopotamian one, we might expect Genesis to refer to the same mountain. If someone were to suggest that the biblical author was borrowing but changed the mountain to associate the text more specifically with Israel, certainly the mountains of Ararat would make no sense. This therefore stands as an important distinction because this is not a matter of different interpretations by different cultures. This is a specific detail. Well, that's because you're forgetting another big religion, and that is Islam. When Islam and Christianity inherited these regions of Turkey, place names were given by the new caliphate or Christian kingdoms. Mount Judy is the Quran's place attachment name for the story associated to their lands. Just as Christianity and Armenia gave their local mountain a biblical reference in their names, it doesn't mean that's where it took place. And before that, the Jews may have been living in this region as well, although more scattered. Once you know where the Garden of Eden is, it all starts to make logical sense. The Garden is Egypt. Eden is the Sahara. The Garden is said to be west of Nod in Genesis. Nod is associated to the desert lands where people wander in caravan nomadic lifestyle. The character of Cain is said to place his city east of Eden, and the flood is said to happen in the Garden of Egypt. So where is this mountain? Well, it's possible that the Arabic name for Judy is a holdover for Judea. So yes, it's far more logical now that we know early Jews were Egyptians, who were banished out of the Garden of Eden to settle in the land of Cain, which is said to be east of Eden. At the time, this was not seen as a land of milk and honey, until they reached more vegetative lands north of Israel. Now let's look at this through the atmospheric perspective. Which regions are more prone to flooding caused by a supermassive volcano, which could have possibly caused atmospheric rain events, like the one that happened over California? Or possibly what they call a medicane, like the one that recently happened over Libya? killing 20,000 people. Northeast Mesopotamia is not prone to massive flooding, which on average have less water than the Nile, individually. Despite being visible from the Tigris, the current is flowing south, away from the mountain range. So during a flash flood, people would not be landing here on boats against the current. But the Nile would allow people to follow the current out of Egypt if the whole delta was underwater, they would be forced by the wind to sail to the coast of Israel, following the known trade routes. This would be the rain event possibly two years after the initial 30-foot tsunami caused by the eruption. Also, the Judean mountain range would squeeze most of the moisture out of the atmospheric rain event or medicate. The dry high pressure over Mesopotamia would block most of that rain although during a volcanic event that may have been disrupted, but it still seems more likely that the rain would be falling in the eastern Mediterranean more so, from Egypt to southern Turkey, 
If these events did happen, then this flood would not only affect Egypt's delta, but also cause flooding in the Dead Sea region, filling up possibly as much as 50 feet above the normal flood stage. This would fill the valley and reach near the foothills of the largest mountain in the region, and that is Mount Hermon, the original Mount Ararat. The only civilization that would have been able to build large arc-like boats would have been the Egyptians with their barges that were used to transport megaliths. These boats may have been used to evacuate people out of the garden, heading out into the Atlantic Sea, aka the Mediterranean Sea, where they would have been surrounded by water on all sides, until they reached the coastline plain of Haifa. From there, they would have been able to see the mountain range of Ararat, not realizing that this place was also affected, especially near the Dead Sea Valley. People may have been taking other boats to flee south towards Egypt. 40 days is not out of the question for an atmospheric river rain event caused by a VEI 6, if not 7, eruption. Author Gary Greenberg shows the parallels with Egypt although I don't agree with every parallel. He points out a clue on page 92 of 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. Because this would be converted to about 25 feet, enough to cover valleys near the foothills of a mountain range. In some areas, depending on the topography and the intensity of the rain, this could have been up to 50 feet high, what we might call a thousand year flood event. Possibly some of the erosion seen on the Sphinx could be from this event. Unlike the recent flooding in the Indus Valley, these waters would be far more concentrated in their area due to the topography and the Dead Sea Plain and Egypt's Nile Valley acting more as a funnel for the water. It's even possible that Egypt got hit twice if the volcano disrupted the monsoon patterns in the Indian Ocean. This could have led to more intense monsoons that hit Atlantia or Ethiopian highlands to flood down the Niles, possibly months after the initial explosion and earthquake. Before I conclude, I want to stress I'm not the only one who's proposed the hypothesis connection between Atlantis and Eden. In 2007, the History Channel produced a documentary about the Cyprus expedition, but there's some red flags we need to consider. I'm your presenter today. I was the expedition leader in the first Garden of Eden back in 2004 uh, when we called it Atlantis. And back in 2004, this by the way is Robert Sarmas project. And I'm just sort of someone that is carrying it on. But really this is what Robert Sarmas had envisioned and the, the beautiful work that he had done to be able to make it such a wonderful, wonderful uh, excursion both in 2006 and 2004. The um, idea, I should confess to you, was given uh, the name Atlantis because Sarmas was very much convinced that Atlantis would have greater commercial value than if we called it the first Garden of Eden. But the, the, the truth of the matter is it was the first Garden of Eden and everybody, after 500 years of seeing this wonderful civilization, they just took it back to their own countries for the next couple of millennium, and they started their own Atlantis story, gave it different meanings, give, giving it different uh, names. Uh, Plato gave it Atlantis. The Indians over in India gave it White Island. And of course, uh, if we look at the Garden of Eden, and it goes to the cuneiform, uh, well, then it, it becomes uh, a different pronunciation. And then when it goes to the Egyptians, even another different pronunciation. It goes to not Eden, but Edward. And then when, the, when 600 BC, when Solon came down and stayed 10 years to get all of the information about this wonderful civilization, he brought it back and another 300 years later, Plato picked it up and he said, 
well, this is a Greek story. So we take the Egyptian name, Edlin, and we're going to add a T-I-S on the end to make it Greek. And it became Atlantis. So, so it's just amazing if you just uh, follow that. So um, anyway, the, the second expedition uh, was uh, sorrowfully not as successful as uh, Sarmast wanted. So Captain Nemo here basically admits that it was money that was the main motivating factor in making this documentary. Whether they truly found Atlantis or not wasn't their priority. We have to be careful with documentaries and books that clickbait us into buying in what they're trying to sell. That doesn't mean we can't learn something from them and find real clues. For example, they are right to keep the law of proximity of the Eastern Mediterranean. Cyprus is a rational candidate, but if you are sincere about what Plato is saying and what other researchers have found on the topic, you will find out that the Cyprus hypothesis would fall apart very quickly. But they are right that Atlantis is an island, but they fail to see the logical possibility that Plato was talking about an island oasis, or a paradise, in the larger continent of Atlantis. Another clue from Plato that they're not aware of is Plato is describing the extent of Atlantis as greater than Libya and Asia combined. This is not just a reference to the continent size, but also the oblong plain length of Atlantis. The extent of the island is elongated in its geography. This would match very well to the Nile Valley's length which extends into Ethiopia. This is what Plato was inferring. But why didn't Plato just clarify that there's sand in the landscape? Well, with a little help at GPT and asking the right questions, you will find that the place name etymology of Atlantis comes from the Greek word Atlantos, meaning sea or ocean. Now hear me out. The Greek word for sand is amos which has the suffix of O-S. The meaning of the prefix of Atlantis in the negative context means to bear or endure the sky. When we take into account the other clues that Plato provides, we see the geographic context that makes the most logical sense is Atlantis means a land of sea of sand a land where the sun bears down on people, and the people have to uphold the land, the paradise, that is reflective to the sky, with the Nile being like the Milky Way River. This is why Plato didn't need to specify the word sand, because it was obvious to the readers at the time because it was incorporated with the place name of Atlantis. This is where there's a direct connection with the word Eden, for Eden also means desert lands, lands that are uncontrolled. So Captain Nemo here is on to something, but before you waste your time on expeditions, you might want to dig deep into the origins of these two place names and see how that fits with the historical, biblical, and archaeological record. So I find it ironic that the flag that they use on their boat has a pyramid on it. By the way, I think Plato alludes to the pyramids as mountains that you can go into next to the plain, but not very high, like a normal mountain. A mountain pyramid for the gods. And Plato also mentions that Atlantis does have actual mountains, which Egypt has in the southern regions and the Sinai which is sheltered to the north at the time of their perspective, but east to our perspective. Keep in mind the cardinal directions were not universal at the time of Solon, so confusion probably came about. And if that's not enough, he also states that Atlantis had springs of cold and hot water at the center of Atlantis, being logically the Cairo region which did have springs along with many other small oases in Egypt. 
Although Greece has this too, we need to keep in mind the other descriptives for context. If that wasn't clear enough, Plato in the English translation mentions Egypt as a part of Atlantis, a region within the larger Atlantis, aka the Sahara. For the Greek, Egyptos means land that lies below the Aegean Sea. But Atlantis basically incorporates all of North Africa to the Greeks. So the name Egypt at the time wasn't necessarily associated to the island oasis, but the general eastern region of Northeast Africa. Keep in mind the island oasis extends far south. But the film does point out another hypothesis that they deny, but at least the History Channel was nice to bring the competing hypothesis up. And that is the Heliki Greece hypothesis. To find out more about this possibility, I meet up with Dr. Dora Katsinopoulou, co-director of the Haliki Project. The site is dated to the 3rd century BC, uh, which uh, is uh, a very rare find. Dora takes me to her dig headquarters, where she stores the artifacts she finds in her search for Haliki. Here we are, where we keep the material from excavations, that is the pottery and other finds. Haliki had a number of important similarities to Atlantis. Okay, so... Ancient sources say the patron deity of the city was also the god of the sea, Poseidon. Let's, uh, start with... He was even pictured on a coin of Haliki found in this area. And it's unimaginable that Plato didn't know about the terrible disaster that befell a city just 100 miles away, and was, like Atlantis, a fierce rival of Athens. Plato, first of all, lived when the earthquake here happened in 373 BC. He wrote his dialogues, uh, Critias and Timaeus, where he describes the catastrophe of Atlantis about 10 years after the catastrophe of Eliki. Very close. The destruction of Heliki was so traumatic that it must have made a profound impression on the residents of nearby Athens. Plato could have hardly written about the destruction of any city without thinking of Heliki. Definitely Plato, in writing the destruction of Atlantis, had in mind the earthquake of 373 BC, which hit this area mm -hmm. and completely destroyed and made uh, the city of Eliki disappear from the face of the earth. If Haliki was the inspiration for Atlantis, as Dora argues, I want to know what evidence she has that she's actually found Haliki. After all, most people believed it was underwater. And most searches have focused on the Gulf of Corinth. Dora reread the writings of the Greek geographer Strabo, who recorded eyewitness accounts of visitors to the destroyed city. He said the city was swallowed by a poros, a Greek word that most people translate as straight. That's sure. why everybody was looking for a leaky in the Corinthian Gulf. In the water. In the water. Mm -hmm. mm, but. Uh, uh, Poros does not mean the Corinthian Gulf because the ancients knew the Corinthian Gulf. Okay. They would call it Corinthian Gulf. Okay. So Poros is a narrow passage of water. Uh, what could uh, this be? This could be a lagoon, mm -hmm. as I interpreted it. It could be a lagoon which was formed in the area of Eliki after the earthquake. And, of course, this lagoon had a narrow a strait mm -hmm. that was connecting this lagoon to the sea. Dora believes a unique geological process created a lagoon here, a process that matches Plato's description of Atlantis being swallowed up. It's called liquefaction. The only time this strange phenomenon has been caught on film was during an earthquake in Japan in 1964. The pressure of the subsiding land pushes underground water to the surface, liquefying the earth like quicksand. Buildings sink into the ground. 
At Haliki, a rush of water from the Gulf of Corinth to the suddenly lower land finished the job. The city became a lagoon. Over time, the Salinas River that still runs next to the site filled the lagoon with sediment, gradually transforming the sunken city into a buried city. This is a reality. It is a discovery. We found it. And Haliki is a fascinating test case for Plato's Atlantis story. Prove positive that a city really can disappear underwater in a single night of earthquakes and tidal waves. But for the man leading our expedition, the suggestion that the story of Atlantis is an allegorical tale just doesn't hold water. Now it's natural that Greek archaeologists want to correlate the small city-state to Atlantis, and rightfully so. But there's another more rational interpretation to look at what happened with Heliki, and how that affected Plato. Heliki was not Atlantis, but they are correct that the local event may have been the catalyst to motivating Plato to look deeper into the rumors of Egypt also going through a natural disaster that was more impactful than Heliki's event. And Plato could use this as a political and philosophical warning to the Persians at the time. Heliki's earthquake is believed to be a 6.5 on the Richter scale, whereas Santorini's possibly could have produced a quake as large as the 2011 quake in Japan, producing a tsunami that could have reached 50 feet or more in some parts of the eastern Mediterranean. And if it produced an atmospheric river event, that could have washed away some of the turbotides in the delta back into the Atlantic Sea or coastal lagoons, washing away some evidence of a tsunami layer. Being in a gardened delta would make it harder to determine this. If I were to produce an expedition, I would first look a few hundred feet off the coast of the delta, under 30 feet of water, and under the Berulius and Carulius lagoons in the delta, for more original Atlantean ruins that may have been buried under silt just like Heliki. For Plato states there was a shoal of mud in the way. The tragedy of Heliki reminded Plato of an older event that also happened in Greece, which led to the Bronze Age collapse. So if it wasn't for Heliki, we may have never gotten another external source like Plato for Genesis. Now, in regards to the Nephilim, after much researching, I have come to the conclusion that it is a conflation between gods and humans, specifically soldiers and kings. It's more likely it was simply a demonizing term given to enemy soldiers, no different than how Israel treats Hamas today. At the time of the Exodus, this would have been placed upon Pharaoh's soldiers. The Pharaohs of Egypt being sons of the gods as a title who had forced arranged marriages upon other tribes that may not have wanted these marriages. The story of Troy may be an example of that, because it would have strengthened the alliance giving birth to more of their enemy soldiers, who then would enforce tributary taxes, a reference to the Nephilim's insatiable appetite. So there is an economic and a political reference to the fallen ones after the flood in Egypt. This is referenced in the Exodus when Pharaoh's soldiers were drowned. But there is also a reference to the Nephilim coming back, and that is because Egypt did come back and rebuilt itself and occupied the land of Canaan. When the Torah speaks of the flood happening over the whole earth, earth in those days was a reference to literal soil, the black earth of the Garden of Eden, that is Egypt. Earth was not used to describe sand, only the actual land with life-giving soil where Adam was molded from, in a poetic sense, because you are what you eat. It may very well be that our planet was named after Egypt's soil. These stories are also used as a moral lesson, just like in Plato's Atlantis. That is all I think these references to the Nephilim are, or Plato's philosopher God Kings, are inferring upon a political conflation to real supernatural entities that they believed in, which we now call UAPs, 
but then was turned into a political allegory demonization narrative tactic. Because in war, that's what happens. It's not meant to be too literal, but yes, there are literal gods, and yes, there are mutations. There may be small supernatural interventions from interdimensional beings, aka angels, but how much of the events of these stories are truly caused by supernatural events versus natural? I'm leaning that there is far more natural forces like politics and disasters. However, after seeing archaeologist YouTuber Milo's trip to Karen Tepe, there are depictions of humans with six fingers and eight fingers holding their phalluses. If this is not symbolic to their offspring, rank, or bird wings, there might be something to this echoing in Genesis, but it's more likely that the original observation of these potential mutant humans was used simply to demonize the Egyptians, not that there were actual mutant humans at the time. They could be taking something older and applying it to the current events of their time. The stories of these mutants may go back to Gobekli Tepe through oral tradition of an actual observational testimony, but not to the overall Genesis stories, which are more recent than we want to believe. So we will have to wait and see if actual burials of humans with these attributes emerge from the regions of Gobekli Tepe. It doesn't mean that it had direct connection to the actual scribes who wrote down these stories from cuneiform to Hebrew. And it doesn't debunk evolution. It might simply mean that UAPs or angels and demons might have a slight hand in manipulating our genes in very rare circumstances if it's not a natural genetic disorder, because polydactylism is a thing. So time will tell. To conclude, I believe this is the most rational hypothesis for Atlantis and the Garden of Eden that I hope to write a paper on in more detail someday. I started out falling for Graham Hancock's New Age ideas on Atlantis in my undergrad, but have finally come to my senses on the reality of history and archaeology. While I'll still keep in mind that there are errors we do need to consider, and there are lessons we can learn from people like Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson and others. For example, on Ancient Apocalypse, Graham Hancock points out that the megalithic chambers on Malta are all pointed south-southeast, which date to around 3000 BC. But instead of correlating to the star Sirius, which is a dot in the sky, why not correlate to something more obvious, like the sun, or their ancestral homeland, their Mecca, which could be pointing directly to Egypt, the original Garden of Eden, Atlantis. One only needs to visit a cemetery garden like this to see that Atlantean architecture still lives on, along with the lessons of Atlantis by Plato and Genesis that gives us a warning about pride. By such reflections and by the continuance in them of a divine nature, the qualities which we have described grew and increased among them. But when the divine portion began to fade away, and became diluted too often and too much with the mortal admixture, and the human nature got the upper hand. They then, being unable to bear their fortune, behaved unseemly, and to him who had an eye to see grew visibly debased, for they were losing the fairest of their precious gifts. But to those who had no eye to see the true happiness, they appeared glorious and blessed at the very time when they were full of avarice and unrighteous power. <laughs>